Okay, welcome back to the final plenary session. This is the hard session. Why is it difficult, anyone? Lunch. Lunch is settling, the brain is processing, and it's not really thinking about complex situations in the world, about practitioner training and career guidance, or any of those things. But it will. And the reason for that is that we have, first of all, a, a wonderful panel here, and we only have one hour with this panel. Secondly, we have a great question set, provocative, thought-provoking, but nobody knows what the answers will be. And thirdly, and most importantly, we have the audience, yourselves here and across the world, connected live. And what we mean by that is that we will have an opportunity for you to throw questions as well. I say throw, throw them at me. And I'm the filter. If I don't understand it, or if I think that it's a little bit what we call off-piste, then I'm going to field it. And I'm going to stick to the topic, because we have a very particular topic for this event, which is all around practitioners and, and competence development. But also in this session, we have a really good range of individuals who can reflect on what's happening in their worlds. And I want to introduce you to that panel now and tell you why I perceive them to be very complimentary in the way that they're going to answer the questions. And we are not going to do the, okay, one, two, three, four, five in every question. It doesn't work like that. It's not very exciting, first of all. And secondly, not everybody will have an answer to every question. And I don't think it's important to do it in that way. So we will direct questions to people where we think, you know what, it would be interesting to know that perspective. So without further ado, I'll start to introduce our panel. And I will start here on the left in the blue with Florian. Uh, Florian is from the ETF. Anyone ETF? Yeah. European Training Foundation. You see, I'm really trying to get them past that lunch break moment. Huh? Florian works for the European Training Foundation, the EU agency that provides policy advice and support to EU neighborhood countries. And you're tasked with supporting the Commission and the EU delegations on the reform of education, training, and employment policies and systems. And you have particular responsibility for career guidance, and there's been work going on. So in a sense, you're working on development of tools and publications and support to policy advice, cooperation, partnerships, etc. And my understanding is you've, you've focused recently on international trends and innovations in a number of countries. And we'll come back on that. But first of all, a round of applause for our first speaker. Thank you very much. Welcome. We'll go to the other side, which is Lukas Sienkiewicz. Best effort. Thank you, Lukas. <laughs> Representing two organizations. Nowadays, one is never enough, I say. We, if we can be two, why not? Uh, so the Gdansk University of Technology and the Institute for Labor Market Analyses in Poland. Uh, here, the big picture, so if yours was the big global picture, Florian, your big picture is public employment services, you're an expert in human capital, in skills development, and labor market policy, with research interests in strategic and evidence-based policy and human capital management. So we've got the big picture, and I always think it's very important because in some countries, we have the traditional school-based guidance model, and then on the other side, the public employment service. And in other countries, this comes together for at least five years before they divide it up again. So I think it's always good to get the dual perspectives. So we've done the outer casing, we move in. Who do we have next? Daniel, you have a wonderful profile to read. Hi, wave Daniel, say hi. Uh, <laughs> bachelor in theology, BA in career counseling, masters in education, a pastor and priest, a little bit of flavor there. We had Chinese language this morning, pastor and priest, and an active career counselor and trainer of counselors. So that's bringing a new perspective as we spoke about. Also. Uh, acting headmaster or assistant headmaster in an independent school, lecturer, and head of Swedish for foreigners. I mean, when do you have any spare time? I have no idea. It sounds like you have a very full plate. Huh? But glad to have you here, and that's a third perspective. But we have, don't lose this, I have no idea what they say otherwise. Huh? We have the fourth perspective, Tristram, here. Tristram Hooley, some of you will know. Uh, numerous universities listed here, one of which is the Inland Norway University of Applied Sciences in Lillehammer, also Professor of Careers Education at the University of Derby. Um, 
chair of the Korea's charity. Is it Advisa or Advisa? Advisor. Advisor like an advisor. Okay, just to be clear. And visiting professor at Canterbury Christ Church University. Again, you guys are all so busy, I have no idea how the hell you have a, a personal life. Um, but you're bringing today a research focus, and we talk here a little bit about that, that the intersection of career, education, technology, and politics, and that you spend a lot of your time helping politicians to try and understand why career education and career guidance is important. Good luck with that. I mean, certainly no, no mean feat. What I also noticed, and I take the opportunity here to raise a little bit here, you're a blogger, and you have this blog. I did go to your blog, Adventures in Career Development. Look it up. But yeah, so you talk there, share some of your thoughts, first-hand experiences, and I think that's important. So you have multiple audiences, and today we also have multiple audiences. That's four out of five. You may notice the gender balance is not perfect here today, <laughs> but nonetheless, Ilse Jansone is here representing, <laughs> oh, look at this, go, go Ilse. Representing two very important networks, Euroguidance in Latvia, of course, and the co-chair of the Euroguidance Network, but also on the IAEVG board. You know, when I was first in guidance, I always used to go IAEVG. Is that the same as the AIOSP? Apparently it was, it was the French acronym. But uh, so representing both of those networks and bringing you know, a strong history of those two networks to the fore. So we have networks, we have research, we have practice. We have public employment and we have the global perspective. I think that's a fairly strong panel to begin with. That's the easy part. Now they have to do some work. You would think they would get paid or something, hey? But I don't know. So let's see. Let me put down those profiles. I have all these wonderful questions which I wrote out, and now I have to decide which ones go first. I think it would be wrong of me to ignore the big picture. And the big picture was that for two years, from March 2020, we were all forced to change the way that we did things. I was actually, the last event I went to was in Dubrovnik with the Euroguidance Network. We all got home and suddenly we had to learn how to do things from our living rooms or our bedrooms or, or wherever. In the career guidance world, that's very difficult when you're used to doing things face to face. And over a two year period, we saw a change. I'm gonna click this forward because I think I'll have the background question for everyone who's following us online. They might get a little lost in my long winded background. Uh, but we saw a change, and we saw the change being that digital and virtual or blended guidance delivery really was brought to the fore. Now, that's not to say that it wasn't already happening. There were pockets of practice, and if you look at various research papers, you will see that in some countries, the journey had already begun. But suddenly, you were forced into, this is the only way. And what I would like to think about, I guess, is... Do we think it's here to stay? That's my question. Not that how important is digital guidance, because I think we've been there, but is it here to stay, or do you think that there is gonna be this convex where we revert back to face-to-face -to -face because we can? And I guess that if we are moving to digital, virtual, and blended guidance, is this then, is it already in the model of training for guidance counselors, or is it not? So I'm gonna perhaps, I mean, I, I would like to ask a few people this question. Um, we'll start, I think, Daniel, is there something here? Do we, yeah, the microphones, hopefully they're on. These guys are controlling it, so you should be, you're on. Is digital already there in the guidance counselor training? Is it something that people feel confident with already? Or has there been this massive escalation in terms of learning? Well, as you, um, as you mentioned, it's been um, widely used since the pandemic. It's, it's been there before, um, but now the pandemic has also taught us a kind of a new, new way to do counseling. I, for myself, I note that the counseling sessions I have with, um, with the students, especially those which have online, even the parents can attend those sessions. Um, and when we have information for parents, before maybe, let's say, 20 or 30 percent of parents attend those sessions, when it was face to face. But through um, when it's online, we have about 70, 80 percent of the parents attending. So, yes, we've started to use it, and I hope and believe it's here to stay. Uh, another thing is that on the uh, training side, 
we've also included IT as a uh, means of communication in a, in a special way in the education. So even it's coming through the, even on the training level. Okay, good. So that's the front line. Um, at network level, Ilse, is there something happening around the, we talked earlier about the upskilling focus of Euroguidance. Is there something there that took place during COVID or that's happening now? Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the digital transition is one of the European priorities currently. Uh, but I have to say that it's kind of a double-edged sword because uh, on the one hand, uh, the forced di digitalization that took place during the COVID period, uh, we've heard of COVID fatigue uh, because it's a, a very difficult social situation to live in, but there's also this COVID digital fatigue w where people have been uh, kind of forced into using digital tools and that's that's been a very steep learning curve and uh, because of the health health crisis, there wasn't a lot of training available. So, that, so there are people that um, there's some who have really thrived and been able to make wonderful use of these tools, but there are others who are maybe a little traumatized and a little over it. Uh, we in Riga, we recently had a Euro Guidance cross border seminar where uh, we were reflecting on hope in times of uncertainty and. Uh, we did hear from uh, practitioners that this uh, this was a, a very difficult journey for them, and uh, one of the things that that's been learned through this is is resilience, and uh, I think that's also what's going to take us forward. Have I answered? Without a doubt. I mean, it's it's always interesting for me to hear of this fatigue, and, and certainly as an event deliverer during the time of COVID. It happened, you know, we got to that wonderful curve of full participation and then within a month you had 10% participation. I think we're hearing the positives, but we're recognizing that digital doesn't always mean engaged and that's, that's useful to know. Let's go to the PES, to the Public Employment Service. I mean, PES, there's no single model, it really does vary from country to country, but still, what happened in, in, in that world and is digital playing an important part now? Yeah, I think that we have to start by saying that digital strategies are pre-COVID in, in many of the past and they have been accelerated basically throughout the pandemic, although some past have remained on the face-to-face uh, -face deliver of services, there were really scarce uh, examples. Majority as a necessity have gone digital online, but they are uh, currently, I think, reverting a little bit to a hybrid model. Although uh, some of the best retained uh, digital first uh, contact uh, strategy, but uh, basically uh, I think they have realized that for some of the services, uh, the face-to-face -face contacts are necessary, especially for some in-depth uh, services and uh, counseling. So basically digital, uh, is a big issue now and also as you said and, and asked in terms of the uh, of the training i think this is one of the key uh, areas of of training in public employment services currently both for uh, employment and career counselors but also for other uh, staff this does not only mean using uh, of, of uh, IT equipment and uh, special programs, but also uh, important skills in terms of uh, self-management, uh, resilience to, f f to changes stemming from the lack of work-life balance, etc., etc. So I think this is very big issue currently in terms of the development of, uh, of counselors, not only in ICT-related competences. Okay, thanks. So we've heard about frontline practice, the public employment service, the bigger networks, we've heard digital fatigue, okay. One thing I think we sometimes do, and I, this is a mistake I would like to get very clear that we don't fall into that trap today, is to look at the bigger picture, the global picture. We, we, we fall into the bubble of the European Union, first of all, or the countries in which we work, Euroguidance is bigger than that. Um, what about digital in the wider world? Is it significant, Florian? Uh, are there examples of practice that we could perhaps look at and learn from? I think you're on. I think they're yeah, all on. I'm trying to understand yet, but yeah. okay. <laughs> okay, well, um, global, just to, to clarify, um, 
global reach is only because ETF is part in the interagency working group, um, where there are OECD, ILO, UNESCO, World Bank, um, CEDEFOP, the, our European sister, and um, we ourselves in the European Commission. And we rather work in Northern Africa, Middle East, Central Asia, Eastern Europe, Western Balkans. So yeah. it's not global, it's still neighborhoods in some way. But what we've seen in the reviews that we've done, and recently we did, we've done 10 reviews in Eastern Europe and in Western Balkan countries, is that digital tools, the use of ICT in career guidance or to facilitate career guidance was there before the pandemic. The issue with the use of digital tools and um, ICT for career guidance is that it's very fragmented. Um, there are many different tools, sometimes donor-driven. Once the donor leaves, the money leaves. It's not being sustained. But I think at, at the bottom line, we can say ICT is here to stay. So definitely, and we see a couple of countries that have quite sophisticated um, approaches in place, um, still fragmented, but very, um, I would say, well-developed. And, and interestingly enough, Ukraine is one of them. Um, and they profit from it now because they can use those tools that are in place, like um, online platform for, for guidance, uh, for counseling, um, through a uh, digital tool. Okay. No, I... It's very interesting. I think you're right. First of all, thank you for clarifying the, the, the outreach of the ETF. Uh, I say global in the sense that it's the bigger picture, but you're right. It's not every country, uh, the neighborhood countries. But interesting to hear that it was already there. And yes, the continuity. And I suppose the idea here is about how embedded is it and how sustainable is it? And is there the money there to keep this going? I mean, OK, even in the 80s when I was working in career guidance, we had what we call digital. It wasn't digital, but OK. We sent it off, and the machine read it, and they sent us back the results. You know, it was done in pencil on one and zeros. It's that old-fashioned. So digital has moved forward. OK, it's one of the big things. It's a key priority. We talk about the twin transitions, you know, digital and green. Um, and certainly, as I say, looking at COVID, the one thing that was seen to escalate most significantly was this. And I just tried to relate it back to that, that capacity building. I have another question. Um, in and around capacity building, really. I'm just trying to find this one. Uh, and it's about the changing world. Um, the changing world of education. I have a couple of questions about the changing world, but I'm going to ask one more. But then I'm going to come out and see what's happening here. So if, you're, if you have a question that you're formulating in your head, now is the time to solidify that question, because Paul's coming into the audience. Yeah? Beware. So. I think about the changing world, I think about changes in education, I think about changes in employment and in status. Uh, for years we've talked about skills data and how important it was, but never did it become so much emerging and on the front page as to say suddenly, not only are people looking at jobs in a different manner, the, gigs, the gig economy for example, but also people are thinking about what they want to do in life. And, and that choice is quite significant, in fact. It's, it's, people are now saying, you know, after two years at home, I'm not sure I want to go back to my job. I want to do something more rewarding. And this is an interesting perspective, I suppose. Uh, and I suppose you add that to the fact that when we have the skills data, and skills data is important because it kind of gives us advanced notification of jobs that may disappear. And it probably doesn't give us advanced notification of the jobs that will appear, but we already know, you know, automation, robotization, as they call it, doesn't require us to do the jobs that they do, but we have to know how to fix these pieces of equipment. So there are jobs that will change. All of those things in mind, how does that translate? How does all that labor market change and in information uh, emerge in the training of practitioners? And here, my question, and I take a long time to get to the question, but my question is, if I look at the health sector, okay, and some years ago I worked with a project working for three years in what they called continuing medical education. And what they told me was that to continue to practice in cardiology, it was cardiology, you have to do a certain number of online training hours per year. It's a requirement. Without this, you cannot practice. And it makes me feel better that one day when someone's looking at my heart that they have an idea what they're doing and it's up to date. 
Should we be then perhaps pushing for uh, continuing guidance education as a prerequisite to practice? Provocative perhaps? I don't know. And maybe is there something already happening on the ground? Are there countries where this takes place? Tristram, I'm conscious we haven't come to you yet. You might tell me, Paul, I have no idea, and I'm quite willing to entertain that answer. But it's, is this a discussion point? Has it emerged? Is it new to you? Um, right. So, well, I think the first thing I would say is, are, are things changing? Is the world of education and work changing? Well, of course it is. Uh, I would say, but it was ever thus. Um, if you look at the kind of occupational mix that was in 1880 and you compare it to the occupational mix that was in 1920, you would see that there, was, there were differences. Um, is it changing faster than ever before? I'm pretty unconvinced that that is the case. I think there are many things that are changing, but there are also lots of things that are staying the same. So do we think, if we think, what's the biggest professions that we have now? Well, things like teaching or healthcare. Do we think if we look forward 50 years into the future, we won't have any teachers? Or we won't have anybody working in healthcare? No, of, of course not. Do we think they'll be doing something different? They'll be using different technologies? They'll perhaps be doing it in a slightly different way? Well, yes, probably. But actually, you know, both of those professions have been amazingly uh, similar over quite a long period of time. So I think we notice change. We don't often notice continuity. And one of the things that we should do when we're thinking about the world that we live in and we're trying to understand it is to, is to recognize that everything is always a balance of change and continuity. And, and you know, sometimes we need to remember that things stay the same just as much as they change. So the issue of, of it seems to me very clear that if, if we believe that career guidance practitioners need to have skills and knowledge in order to do what they do, and we, we argue, as we argue in many countries, that people should be qualified to level six or level seven in order to do this job. It seems to me indefensible to say, well, once you've qualified, that's it, that's all you need. You never need to think about this again. You never need to learn another thing again. And we were just hearing in a workshop about Estonia and Greece where, where they've got a five-year cycle of reaccreditation. And that's you know, really interesting. In, in, other countries, we have uh, situations where people have to maintain registration and you have to, for example, do a certain number of days of, of continuing professional development each year. That sort of thing seems to me to be quite important. If, if we have professionals, if we trust professionals to do the right thing, we also need to put in place the kinds of conditions that make sure that, that those professionals stay competent throughout their whole working life, which could be 50 years or, or whatever. So I absolutely think that's a good idea, and it does exist in many countries, but not in all. You, f you make me feel safer, but just with that <laughs> response. That not everything is changing, Paul, don't stress. I like that. Thanks, Tristram. Could we go over to Daniel? Daniel, from the front line, how, how does it feel? And, and as someone who also is responsible for working with the training of future guidance practitioners, is it something, sound like a good idea or is it too hard to enforce? The, the requirement for some sort of continuing professional development? Well, <clears throat> I, I would, I would um, say that that should be really up to the individual's responsibility because once we're trained, we have the basics, um, the basic qualification. And then of course, depending on the, what's happening in the society, I think it should be um, the individual responsibility to go for further uh, development. Just what we're doing today here. This is, this is in a sense, how to you know, adjust to the various changes we see in the society. So I don't think it's, it's um, you know, advisable to say, you know, you know, by kind of a, by law, everybody has to, but encourage and create the, um, the uh, situation for practitioners to, um, to develop themselves, I think, will be vital. Good. I like it. So encourage, not require. Lucas, what happens in the PES, in the Public Employment Service? Are there requirements for upskilling? Is it encouraged or is it not even a thing? 
as everywhere, it's differentiated very much in, in different paths, but uh, I think that uh, there are some examples like uh, recent uh, developments in the German public employment services where they change their competence model for the staff uh, that is being, uh, if, if I, I have noted myself some competences there like IT and media competences, self-organization, shaping digital change, virtual cooperation, uh, sensitivity, they want to change uh, towards uh, that model either in initial training uh, of, uh, at, the, at the Bundesagentur University uh, and also for the uh, current staff. So basically uh, it will be very much required to retrain a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of competences that probably have been also developed throughout work uh, and other uh, support uh, um, tools like uh, mentoring, coaching, or, uh, or, or courses that these employees already have, but basically they will be required to, to develop constantly. I think what is the biggest change for the practitioners in, in public employment services uh, is work with new uh, uh, labor, ma uh, labor market intelligence models and artificial intelligence tools, and I think that in this area definitely there will be requirements for further development. You can't cope uh, with these changes without uh, being trained or, or retrained. So basically, as for the career guidance professionals, they have to be at least uh, able to understand how this uh, modeling uh, works and uh, how uh, the data are derived from, from the models in order to uh, understand the uh, changing labor market requirements for their clients. So basically I think these are the areas where, uh, where uh, for practice professional in public employment services do have challenges um, you know, in, the, in the coming years at least. Okay, good. I mean, again, just trying to get that, that different footprint across the different actors here. Now, as promised, I'm going to go out into the field here. You know, let's see what happens. Is there anybody who said, I'm going to throw a question at them and they're never going to be able to answer it? Do we have one of those? No? Does any, ah, we have one question, however. Can I borrow one of these microphones here? I don't know what happens when I walk out. It could start screaming, but we'll see. Let's go live. And then we're going to see what's happening online. We have somebody monitoring the chat. I have a question, and it's concerning the clients, not, not the skills of the counselors. Uh, could you tell me from your practice whether this shift to online guidance, can you see it as a democratic, democratic process or not? So does the access towards the guidance services broaden or not? Because what we experience is, well, in a sense, yes, because uh, people don't have to travel. They can get online from remote areas. But on, on the other hand, lots of people don't have uh, either the skills. Yeah, let's say older people sometimes they're afraid of using Zoom or other programs, or sometimes they just don't have the access towards internet. They don't have the good connection. They don't have uh, the applications. Okay. So how do you see the future? Pick two people. <laughs> okay. You don't get five. <laughs> huh? Okay, but I'm gonna ask Tristram and. Um, the lady, of course. Ilse. We have to have gender balance. Wonderful. Okay. So, uh, Tristram. Yeah. Well, I mean, you've sort of answered your own question, haven't you? It, in the, um, it, it depends on it depends on what you're doing and who you're doing it with. And so, if you, one of the great promises that the digital forms of guidance offered was increasing access. And so. Uh, uh, um, the Inland Norway University, we, we run a course on blended guidance and we had a student there who was from Finnmark in the north of Norway and previously he was driving, you know, his life as a guidance counsellor was driving from sort of small settlement to small settlement. He was away from his home and family all week and, and the people in each of those settlements would only get the chance to see a guidance counsellor if they knew that he was coming, you know, less than, you know, less than once a week because he would have to cover this whole big area. When he started to move this online, he opened up access, you know, hugely to people who who were generally quite digitally literate. And they're in, you know, in Norway. They're also in remote areas, so they they have to transact. Norway's got a big agenda, which is all about putting public services online. So they've really 
pushed uh, resources into it and helping people to train. So, you know, on that level, definitely a positive, increases access and so on. But of course, you're right. There's, a, there's this, these other groups that we talk about, about people who have uh, limits to, to the amount of digital access that they have. But, um, also, if, if there is some advantages in having a service which has a, a, an office in the high street where you can walk down and you see it and you can, can walk in through the door and so on. If you have to go online and search it, even, even if you're capable of doing that and not everyone is, you, you may never find it. So, so there are, of course, pluses and minuses to this. And I think what, what I've tried to advocate for is a, is a blended guidance service. And, and what we're trying to do with that is to create some sort of equivalence. It doesn't matter how you access guidance. There are probably many routes through which you could access guidance. But once you get it, you get something that's equivalent to what somebody else gets. And I think, I think that's the important principle. And that we, we're not going to be able to ever get to a position where you say, well, there's only one way, and that's going to work for everyone. So I think, I think that's my answer. But it's basically what you said. So. Thanks, Tristan. Do you have anything to add, Ilse? Well, I, I really like the provocative uh, nature of this equation. Does digital equal democratic? Uh, and I, I do think that uh, not just uh, access to like digital skills, but also access to infrastructure, is, is your internet signal strong enough to be able to have a quality connection? Um, and the interesting thing is that digital skills aren't scarce only among older people, as is the stereotype, but a lot of young people are more consumers of digital products and don't necessarily know how to use uh, digital tools for uh, uh, sorting everyday issues like, like uh, career choice, accessing in, uh, labor market information and things like that. Um, I perhaps am a little bit of a, an optimist, but uh, I do very much appreciate the the EU policies that do recognize that uh, digital upskilling is very important. And we also heard yesterday from our uh, officer in the DG employment that 2023 is uh, earmarked to be the uh, European year of skills and these, uh, the development of digital skills to ensure a socially just uh, digital transition is, is a priority. So. So it's not just a concern on the ground, but uh, people in policy are aware and are trying to find solutions. Thanks, Ilse. Um, other questions? There are lots of you and only one of me. You must have, oh, we have something. What is it? Let's go live to the net. Huh? Let's see. Do we have something, Nina? Yes, we do. Go for it. Uh, well, we have two questions in the, in the chat. And the first one was just discussed. Uh, I mean, lack of dig digital skills. So I think we will move to the next one. Um, uh, the world is changing faster than we think. There are some models of career guidance talking about slow your career. Comments, please, about that. Slow your career. Yeah, slow, your career. slow your career. In fact, yeah, I heard another one this morning, degrowth. Who wants to take it? It's open house. Anyone thinking about slow your career? It's, is it about well-being are we talking? Or is it about, you, you're familiar with this concept? Um, I, I think it sort of links back to one aspect of your previous question about this, uh, the, the fact that the whole world was put on the brakes during the COVID era. There were a lot of people who uh, were, uh, they couldn't go to work. They, they, they had a lot of time on their hands and they started to rethink their careers. Um, and actually that's that's something that's very important to, to career planning, is, is the time to consider what your next steps are going to be. And I think that's, that's why this issue comes up of uh, uh, what are my aims? What do I want to do with myself? What direction should my career take? Uh, am I working simply to uh, meet performance targets or to meet shareholder expectations? Or am I doing something to bring value to the world which corresponds to my values? So I think this period is actually uh, very fruitful for the career guidance field 
And we've also been discussing in the IAVG National Correspondence uh, Network that it's so important that we should make career guidance more visible uh, to the public. And I think the, the Global career, career Guidance Month is, is a very important step in that direction. People need to know that when they come across these bigger questions that they have support to, to make a positive transition to take a step in the direction that will benefit them. Okay, thanks, Ilse. I think uh, we want to get something from Lukas to Not add. Not about uh, just slowing, but from the past perspective, I think that digitalization has made some functions basically obsolete, uh, especially in terms of uh, administrative uh, functions all taken over by some you know, self services and uh, uh, and chatbots etc so they are not basically suggesting their employees to slow their careers but to redefine their careers and they help them uh, actively in this for example belgian flemish as VDAB have developed a career campus uh, for their administrative staff, staff to redefine their roles completely. So basically, I think that the changes are really uh, down to earth in many, in many cases. So I think that for these people, slowing down the career is not an option, but redefining it is. It, it is. Okay, I like that. I mean, I'll be honest with you. I rang a taxi the other day. The app didn't work. I got through to a machine that doesn't understand a Scottish accent. And ultimately, I swore at it, and it put me through to the operator. I thought they were going to tell me off. But what they actually did was eventually put me through to a human. But I imagine the number of humans are disintegrating in that industry because they think technology leads the way. That's just a buy note. Actually, Tristram, I want to build on something here. I don't know if you've got something. I did say to them at the outset, if I ask you a question and you have nothing to tell me, please feel free. But it's about the, the changing nature. It's reflecting on what you just said, Ilse, about slowing the career, but also about how we had a chance for reflection during COVID. And I think if I look at younger people today, and I can say that I'm over 50, they're not the same as I was in the 80s when I was in that age group of 15 to 25. They are more socially conscious, as, as the young people are more socially conscious. And we hear uh, quite often about these changing visions for a career, a career that has uh, a focus on achieving the sustainable development goals of the future, tackling poverty, inequality, injustice, etc., which is great, fantastic. No longer, as you say, working for the dollar, but thinking about what your bigger contribution is to the world. Has that translated, do you think, into practice? Is it a consideration? Um, I know I'm asking a big question here, but is there, do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, it'd kind of be nice if that was true, wouldn't it? And there's, there's a guy on Twitter who does these uh, strands where he's, he looks at things are not the same as they used to be, and he finds quotes going back to the Middle Ages where people are complaining that young people are not as, you know, not as yeah. adventurous or as tough or whatever as they used to be, or, or, or you know, whatever. The things are moving faster than they ever were. And, and he goes back through all the different decades and, and, and finds there have always been people saying these kinds of things. And some of it is, you know, older people seeing younger people and forgetting how they were when they were young. But I mean, I think, so I think there's a couple of, of things going on here. Is it, is it good if people think about more than just money? Well, particularly in, in a situation where you're reasonably well off, then it probably is qu quite good that you should consider that there might be something more to life than just making the biggest pile of money there is. If you're at the bottom of society, I think you can reasonably say that you might want a bit more than you've already got. And so it does depend, again, on who, who you're talking to. Um, do I think that in career guidance we should be encouraging people to think about the wider implications of their actions? Yeah, I, I do. I think that would be, it's important. We talk, we give people labour market information that encourages people to think about things like how much they can earn, what qualifications. We don't tend to give people labour market information that encourages them to think about what's the social impact of, of if I choose this job, what's the environmental impact if I choose this job. And it seems to me that we could quite reasonably expand the kinds of conversations that we were, would be having with, with 
well, younger people, but also people in mid-career who are making career changes. Many people uh, who are in mid-career, one of the things they look for when they change career is to do something that's more meaningful, that, that they see, that makes them feel they're doing something good for the world. So, you know, the, the improving the, the, the life for the community and the people around them and so on. So I think we absolutely should be talking about these issues of social justice, of community. And I think where it, where it is impossible to deny we have to have some kind of response is, is in the climate crisis. And lots of young people are, are worried about the climate crisis. And they're not just worried about it because they're altruistic. They're worried about it because they're genuinely frightened and anxious about what is going to happen in the future. So I think there's lots, there's lots that we can say. And these issues of values are very important to career choice. And I think we should probably talk about them more than we do. And Ilse. Is it okay if I jump in? I just, Please do. Uh, as you were speaking, Tristan, I was very much reminded of the United Nations the Sustainable Development Goals. And there have been several conversations lately about how these sustainable goals are linked to career planning. And I know that uh, the Your Guidance Network uh, has a working group who's looking into these green guidance issues. Uh, and I also uh, can recommend to follow the developments in various IEVG conferences. The one that happened uh, in spring of this year in cooperation with the Asia Pacific Career Development Association brought out several very interesting examples of how career practitioners and also careers educators are integrating the sustainable goals in their career conversations and career uh, education. Good, so it's, it's not just in my head that this it should be a conversation and it's starting to be a conversation. I think in education per se, in primary and secondary, we've been having the conversation for a while. Okay, I've, I've, I've two bits left, but again, any last thoughts from the audience? I'm trying to bring you in, guys, it's not happening, no. Anything from the world of the web? Good. So I still have two, so I'm fine. One, the world is a complicated place. We know this, Ukraine. We can't ignore that word. It is something that hit us all hard. We saw what happened. We have a movement of people. There have been, over the centuries, lots of movements of people. But this is a fairly rapid and significant movement of people into certain countries. And all aspects of our societies are responding positively and quickly. But I wonder if this is what's happening right now in terms of being able to respond effectively. How do we uh, embrace these new citizens, be they there for a short while or a longer period? And as career guidance counselors and practitioners, do we have the right skill sets? In other words, because it's a different skill set. Let's be honest, and I've, I, I've worked in this, I wrote papers on this 10 years ago, on working with refugees who come into a country, and they tell me, and they joke, and yes, people have, still have a sense of humor, but they joke, and they say, Paul, the last thing we're thinking of when we're running for our lives is to pick up our certificates. And it's a very important feedback that I got, that it's quite true that then when you're asking for recognition down the line, you don't have evidence. So how are we working in terms of learning and skills recognition, profiling, helping these individuals to access education, training, and employment? These are the three big ones, because this helps them to form some form of normality. Of course, we are looking past the reception, engagements, so housing, etc., but at a point where they want to become active in their new society. So I'm going to ask, I mean, okay, we're talking about the Ukraine. So first of all, Let's talk about Europe, let's focus in on Euro guidance, perhaps in IEVG, and then let's look at the neighborhood countries who will be equally impacted by this. So those two, perhaps if I start with you, Ilse, again. Pressure on you being in the middle here and the only female, so everyone wants you to answer. Well, I feel a little embarrassed to be monopolizing the, the conversation. I hope colleagues will forgive me. Uh, but uh, yes, the, the Euro guidance network, uh, I think, had a very quick response to the situation because we realized that uh, this is a, a new challenge coming in to the career guidance field and there was a collection of uh, articles and tools and so far we have organized a total of uh, three uh, online learning sessions for counselors 
on different aspects of uh, providing guidance support to people uh, in the refugee situation. Uh, among those activities actually was a, a, a session right before lunch that, uh, or yeah, the first morning session online was with Anne Chant and also Sunderland. Uh, that uh, the IAVG coordinated to bring to this this event, uh, and I hope that uh, you will follow more information in the conference follow-up about about these activities. Okay, Florian, are there? Right. Is it as as significant? I mean, my my world doesn't extend beyond the European borders, sadly, so I'm not really familiar. But geographically speaking, surely it's as important. Yeah, sure. Um, you mentioned the one side, the displaced Ukrainians that move to EU countries or to other countries like Moldova, and there are a lot of internally displaced within Ukraine okay. moving to the west of the country. It's not that it's um, really safe, but it's obviously different than in the east. And um, exchanges with the Career Guidance Association in Ukraine showed that um, I mean, it's very difficult to know what these people need. It's all a bit chaotic. So there's a real need to find out about the needs of these displaced people. And I just um, quote very quickly from an exchange uh, with, a, with a person I know who had to flee. The, the trouble is really that um, you're in that difficult position of deciding, what am I doing? Will I invest in staying or will I go back? You know that hope is important, but this is one of the core questions for the people and that sometimes hinders uh, engaging into certain activities that might be related to, to support to them. Uh, what I wanted to say is also um, the ETF together with the European Commission worked with the Ukraine before, obviously, many years intensively, so Ukraine has a national qualifications framework. Um, it is a good source for recognition of qualifications. Um, Ukraine uses the ESCO terminology, so it's another source for helping recognizing skills. Um, Ukraine is um, using Europass, it's available in Ukrainian. So we did a lot of work to ensure that kind of official recognition. Um, on the other hand, in terms of direct support, uh, we started a project called Re-Emerge Ukraine, and that's related to micro-credentials being set up for priority sectors, the country, so we're in constant um, exchange with the ministry, that the country defined for themselves, that is um, uh, energy efficiency, that is um, restoration, and it is um, reconstruction, and those micro-credentials that we're developing um, together with the ministry um, are related to those sectors and it will be accompanied by a career guidance component to help those people that um, are either out of jobs or displaced and don't have work or have work in, in sectors where it's difficult to survive to up or reskill in a relevant sector that the government invests in. Okay, that's it. so it's not just about recognizing where you are now, which not, might not be a great place, but looking yeah. at steps towards you know, positive integration yep. for whatever period of time. And it's quite right, actually. What do I want to do next? I have no idea. I just got here. You know, so maybe we have to think of it as a bigger picture. But Does to anybody, add, you want one, to add one more Daniel? point to yeah. add, um, you know, it's still a war. So yes. um, we, we cannot get active right now. I mean, we, we're starting with piloting that, that re-emerge initiative, but having active career guidance in that setting, um, we, we need to wait till the country, so to say, ready. We, we have to... No, and I think from your perspective, it. that's all right. But I'm hearing a lot, let's say, my nearest country that I talk a lot with are the Irish. And a lot of people are there, and they're, they're looking at how do we actively engage people in sectors that are perhaps looking for some form of experiential profile or certification to get in. Daniel, you want to bring something? Yeah, <clears throat> just, just two perspectives. Um, one is more the, from the specific perspective, the, um, the population from Ukraine coming to Sweden, for example. Um, some regulations don't apply for this group. They've been somehow given the benefit to go on the fast lane, which, which creates some kind of tensions compared to um, 
groups you know, from other countries who have to go through all the regulations. So this is, this is a challenge. Having said that, thinking about the practitioners, I think um, the, um, the increase in um, immigration totally has forced us to explain what career counseling is. We, we have to really explain to um, individual, you know, people coming from countries where they don't, you know, they're not used to career counseling. So it helps us really to, um, to explain and to be very, very, what shall I say, um, pedagogical in, in what we're doing, instead of, as opposed to just doing what we're doing. We have to talk about it, explain to the, to the individuals. Okay, well, that's very useful. It's one hour. We can't change the world. We wanted some thoughts. We've had some good thoughts. But I will give you a closing word each shortly. I first want to ask somebody from the technical team to come down and be ready because we're going to have a live Mentimeter in a couple of minutes and somebody needs to run it for me. Um, what I'd like to ask now, I mean, we really are rushing up to 3 o'clock here. Capacity building. Counselors and professionals and practitioners, there's a big group of individuals across the world. Capacity building is about skills development. That can be part of the initial academic training of an individual professional, but also something that a qualified practitioner who's been in place one, five, 10, 50 years needs to think about. What's the number one on the list in terms of the skill sets that we should say, listen, this has to be number one. We've talked about a few things, could be any one of those or something else. We're going to go from here across the board. It's an impossible question, I know, but if you had to pick one thing and say this is it. To, to start with, it depends on the context. Okay. So it depends very much if you're in Armenia, if you're in Ukraine, if you're in Kazakhstan or in Germany. Um, so that's, that's one point. But one thing that is really important for me is... Um, Writing a CV and knowing how to behave in an interview will not people help manage difficult transitions. Saying that, I want to say um, career guidance practitioners that are also developing their own social emotional skills, um, learning to learn skills, uh, will be better placed to support those kind of skills to be developed in their clients. Okay, good. Tristram. Uh, I mean, I think the nice framework for career counsellors' competencies is a pretty good one. Um, and out of that, I'd probably pick on the pedagogic side, the ability to understand how people learn and to support learning in a variety of ways. But, uh, you know, I think, I think having a strong framework for the competencies for, of career counsellors is probably more important than us drilling down and saying, well, you know, this week it's digital or next week it's you know, okay. knowing about artificial intelligence or whatever. I think, I think we need to say there are things that career counsellors or careers professionals need to be able to do. This is what they are, and then we work and adapt them as context changes. Good. Uh, yes, and I think the uh, IAVG is also famous for having a competency framework. You can see it on the IAVG.com website. But uh, also in the context of this conversation, I think that maybe the most important skill at the moment is to be able to reflect on our practice and to understand uh, our skills gaps and to be able to map out our own uh, career path in terms of upskilling, to understand where, where we need to improve our practice to be better able to serve our clients and to be more confident professionals. Since the word reflection has been taken away from me, um, I would say uh, develop um, annual cycle um, and begin begin um, at an earlier at a, at an earlier age with with our with our students. Okay. I think there are so many of these important competences. An obvious answer would be going digital, but. I think that adaptability is more, more important than this because we can't predict every changes that are coming and we tend to be silo thinking in a sense uh, and stick to good old ways and this is something we have to effectively combat basically. 
Thank you, Lucas. Thank you, everybody. Now, let's do this in a fun way. We're going to start, as I introduce each person, we want to thank them, but we start very slowly, and we build up to the most fantastic round of applause you've ever seen. So we start, Florian, thank you very much. Tristram, Ilsa, Daniel, and Lucas. Yay! Fantastico. Okay, so that's, this is what you get when you get a lot of people answering one question. I mean, it's like a crazy cloud of words. I'm coming up close because some of these are really small. I love the fact that inspiration sits at the very heart of it. Some of the words we already heard, reflection, adaptability, ideas, change, good practices. And then we get into the heart of it, you know, removing the barriers, changes, and so on. I'm not going to read them all out. We don't have the time. Thank you very much. But there's one more question. And I believe we're just going to see it live. This is the bigger picture now. This is the community. This morning, Margit gave us a call to action. The call to action was, what's the biggest priority? We asked the five panelists that question. As all good panelists, they gave me back a bigger question. But the idea is not as simple, perhaps, as we think. That sometimes it's about the framework, or it's about learning to learn to be able to address what are continuing challenges. And I love the fact that flexibility boosts in there. But we need all of you to put this out, online and in the room. Everybody answer this question, because this, when we heard from Cynthia this morning as well about the 13th of December, Global Careers Month, how do we identify emerging messages from today? Think of the word messages this morning, that Scottishism, that you're building your own portfolio in a sense of things that you need to collect along the way. I heard some fantastic examples today, this morning, and now, we want you to continue with that in the third session. But please answer those two questions. You can see already social justice, adaptability. It's really hard to follow when they keep moving like that. Huh? Communication. So don't stop doing that. But now I'm going to go back to the slides. Or this guy is. I'm just going to rely on him to do it. Um, because I just want to remind you what the next steps are. We are already five minutes over, but we can survive that. Huh? So in terms of the slides, we are moving into parallel session three anytime soon. And at that point, there will be all these groups as before. A is here, B, C, D, E in the round hall, F and G online. It was really effective. It worked really well this morning. Of course, before then, I was, that, I mean, it's the final part where we will be together because at four o'clock, you come back outside here for the poster session. But we have some live updates. And Petter is going to come forward. Of course, it's always appropriate for you to take the final words, Petter. So over to you. OK. So as Paul said now, so it's the last plenary session. It means something like the first end of the conference. So <laughs> but the last, last workshops are very interesting. So stay with us till the end. We have one announcement, one surprise for you from 4 o'clock. Because from 4 o'clock, it will be not just the poster session. It, it, it means dialogue with poster authors around this in atrium. So they are ready to speak with you, to speak each other with, with the real people around the posters. So it's, it's also a coffee, of course. But it's mainly about to use this time for networking, to ask people for the, uh, around the posters. Please use this opportunity. And additionally, surprise is that in this main hall from 4 o'clock will be hybrid online poster session and ne hybrid networking. So it means that you can choose that you will be there uh, in, around posters from 4 o'clock or here sitting and look to the screen to the Zoom because they are disadvantaged, these, these people. They are let, we have a lot of advantages that we are here. But they are somewhere there in Zoom, and we can be connected with them and to have a dialogue together. So to, to see the online posters, we have online poster session also. So you can choose the networking there with real posters and the networking here. And from 4 o'clock also one uh, presenter from another workshop will have like more interactive part here from 4 o'clock, so it will be 
very nice um, some ab about one poster will be short workshop short hy hybrid workshops here uh, around one poster so it will be very interesting program also here from four o'clock so you cannot find it in program but it's something additional so I could I would like to invite you to be with us to be also from four o'clock will be interactive session here it's something additional so be here with us, please, from four to five, and you can you can walk from here to there and and to network and to see, to see the program here. And now you have very short break to go, but you will be late because I have to say official goodbye. So it it's the really official goodbye, from, because we have a, no other meeting together now. So. It was very nice to be with you whole day and stay here till five. And stay with us longer because we have this Padlet online session. It will be live next days, next weeks, because there is a communication tool to comment the online posters and you can contact the people around the posters. So it's a networking which continue after the conference. This Padlet, it's like a for networking, communication after the conference. So it's, it's important information. And I would like to invite the team here, please, because maybe we would like to thank them. <laughs> and this one thanks to Czech team. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> you are with me here. And we have also Přemek there. He, would, who, he wouldn't go here. Přemek, stand up, please. It's <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And also, of course, we have Eva, Ilse, Margit, Nina, and the European part of organizing team, because it was Europe. It's not Czech. It's a European real Euroguidance conference. And also we have a film team from other European colleagues. We have a lot of teams around which are partly European Euroguidance and partly Czech. So it's because this cooperation of all, it is this result. Without the cooperation, no result of the conference. So thank you and goodbye. And if Paul would like to say something more, so it's now. I know. Thank you very much. Thank you to the organizers. Thank you to everybody. Enjoy the next part. Please do stay because there are next parts, but we're not just going to force you to come back here just to say goodbye. But if you see us, you can wave. You know, that's absolutely fine. Okay. Thanks. Enjoy the next session. Let's go. <laughs>